Crush your enemies. They drew first blood, not me. See them driven before you? Oh, my user. And they hear the lamentation of the women. But I pity the fool. Glitter in the dark near the ten hours of gate. Phone home. They're here. Oh, real light sleeper, Charles. Welcome to Vintage Video Season 3, where we're re-watching the 80s so you don't have to. We'll be reviewing every major film release of the 1980s in chronological order, overanalyzing what you've seen and spoiling what you haven't. I'm Patrick O'Reilly. I'm Jesse Bayless. And I'm Richard Wells. And today we're discussing Island of Blood, released January 1st, 1982. It was written and directed by William T. Nod and released by Action International Pictures. Not much to report on this one. It's also been released as Scared Alive or Who Done It, and was supposedly based loosely on Agatha Christie's And Then There Were None, which is in a way true of any film where a <laughs> mysterious killer takes out the members of the cast one at a time. Yeah, I guess uh, even Halloween. <laughs> right, yeah. If you want to class it up, you say it's an Agatha Christie adaptation <laughs> without her name on it. Do you recall the last time a film claimed to be an adaptation of Agatha Christie's And Then There Were None? It was another one of our January 1st titles for last season. Oh, God. Barely made horror film. Uh, Scream? That's right. Ah! Nice. Byron Quisenberry's Scream Quisenberry. from 1981. <laughs> Not to be confused with Wes Cravenberry's, <laughs> or, or as his professional name, Wes Craven. Oh, man. I really want there to be a serial now. Called, called Cravenberry's? <laughs> yeah. We start in killer POV, peeking over bushes at a backyard pool as a girl prepares to go in for an early morning swim or a late night swim. I don't know. It's definitely <laughs> day for night. She sets down a small tape deck and tightens a swim cap to swim the length of the pool. On the other side, she surfaces, pauses her music, a hand restarts the music, and when she turns to see who did it, she stares down the barrel of a gun, which fires, and somehow takes her head clean off. Oh, yeah. And we watch it roll slowly to the bottom of the <laughs> pool. <laughs> like, did he shoot perfectly in the middle of the neck? <laughs> I don't know what happened here. I mean, I think you'd have to have it right up against the neck, too. Or this is just like, we skipped some steps, and he killed her <laughs> and then took the head off. We hard cut from the head at the deep end to the opening credits, starting with a title card for the alternate title, Who Done It, which is the title they went with for the Vinegar Syndrome Blu-ray, which is what we'll be reviewing today. Yeah, the transfer of this is great. Isn't it wonderful? Yeah, I was very impressed. That was part of why I was like, eh, hey, maybe we don't need to do this one. I can't confirm that it came out in 1982. And I was like, it looks nice. Well, at least I could sit so, through the, a Blu-ray of anything. Yeah, I was going to say, if somebody bothered to make a Blu-ray of something, yeah. it's got some some redeeming quality. <laughs> we see some aerial footage of a small island and a pair of musicians, Jim and Phil, with an actress, BJ, dragging their luggage across a beach. They seem to imply that most of the luggage is hers, but she's only carrying a guitar case. I recognize this small section of beach as Paradise Cove, home oh. to Bob Morris's Paradise Cove Beach Cafe in Malibu. So they're literally right off the uh, the outdoor seating area. Yeah. We cut from there to the car of the filmmakers of the film within the film, driving down PCH and hoping the cast have all arrived at the location ahead of them, which seems unprofessional. Like, shouldn't someone from the crew be <laughs> yeah. there before the cast? We cut to a grumpy boat captain, Bert, arms overloaded with groceries. He complains about the movie people making him ferry them back and forth to the island for this shoot why you're getting paid i don't know it's this his, is job. Your job. This is his job man i hate the thing i do all day every day i mean i get it bert well <laughs> and he doesn't want people on the island either why does he why does he bother if he doesn't want this job and he doesn't want people on the island don't take people yeah. to the island just and take don't them out to the middle of the know. ocean and and night moves them and he takes care of the island too and it's just like just don't just don't do that for people yeah <laughs> He's intercepted on the path to his boat by the mayor? Yeah. <laughs> this is the mayor. Bert says, You hear his mayor or what? But then refers to him as a real estate snob, so who knows what this guy is. <laughs> Bert charges 50 bucks for info about the island. He says the widow that owns it is donating it to a church group to host retreats in exchange for a huge tax break. The deal goes through at the end of the summer. Wouldn't the mayor already know all of this information? Yeah. Bert is just angry at this guy for planning to buy and pave the island because Bert went to school there somehow and has good memories from that time. <laughs> Did you take a ferry out to the island school every day? Yeah, the island didn't really seem like it was too, like, hospitable. Yeah. From the aerial footage. Yeah. 
We see the filmmakers arrive at the marina and one of them says, You like the idea of the dancer on crutches, huh? Which was added in post to explain why the character of Lynn is inexplicably on crutches for the whole film. In reality, actress Janine Marie broke her foot a couple days before filming and there wasn't time to recast the part. We cut to the abandoned school on the island and we get a montage of the cast waiting while one of the musicians tools around on a guitar. Lynn stands on her crutches and leaves to explore the property and a horny jock character follows her out of the room. She seems annoyed in a super hot way that gives me Parker Posey vibes. <laughs> Donna, the dancer, points out to John, the nerd, that BJ has brought along a whole band and a ton of luggage, but John claims to have seen her audition. She's a no talent. I saw her audition. Donna says BJ is a widow of a millionaire. BJ tells her band that she has to go to the bathroom, and in her absence, Jim complains about this shitty gig until his bandmate Phil reminds him that at least it's a job. She's paying us, isn't she? Yeah. Later, the actor, Steve Nash, playing Phil, requires a similar reminder from Dr. Peter Venkman. We're paying you, aren't we? Yeah, but I didn't know you were going to be giving me electric shocks. Lynn and the horny jock dude find the house with all the bedrooms and decide to christen one of the rooms together. Jim decides to quit the band and gets impatient when Bert takes too long to bring the boat back. The third band member, Taylor, with the jagger hair, has already been built up as a Debbie Downer pessimist guy who suggests that maybe the boat will never come back, but also admits that it definitely will because the only things that ever work out are the things that don't matter. Jim tells him to stop whining about everything, and Taylor starts talking to his own hand as if it were a puppet, which it actually seems to have a face drawn on it for some reason. <laughs> This is this is why you needed a Blu-ray of this movie. Yeah, otherwise yeah. you would miss this detail. <laughs> can you can you do me a favor, just a little favor? Could you <clears throat> shut up? Just shut up, because you're depressing. Oh, Taylor, he thinks we're depressing. Hmm. Well, we may be depressing, but he's stupid. <clears throat> and then he slams the guy in the gut with his guitar, and for some reason Jim lets him get away with it, like I expected them to come to blows after that. The boat arrives with a seasick director on board. BJ asks Donna where she might be able to change, and she sends BJ upstairs as a prank because she overheard Lynn and the jock, who I think is named Rick, planning sex up there. Before she leaves, BJ confirms for Donna that this is her first film credit, meaning it's everyone's first film so mm -hmm. far in the cast. Of course, BJ accidentally barges in on the happy couple and backs out embarrassed. Also, I mean, I assume there's probably more than one bedroom. Yeah, she picked the exact one that they yeah. went up to. Donna wanders into the basement and we get glimpses of someone moving around in the shadows down here wearing a mask. She hears a wet squish and a cat meow and suddenly finds a skeleton hanging from the ceiling, but it has a note attached implying this is a prank prop. Around the corner we see the man in a mask hiding with an enormous machete and when he finally has her cornered she screams. He raises the weapon and pretends to slash down at her a couple times before removing the mask to reveal himself as John the Nerd in a killer costume with a cardboard blade. Do you guys recall the last time we saw someone fighting with cardboard? <laughs> History of the world? That's right. Oh my god! I'm fighting with cardboard! John explains it was all a goof and Donna angrily storms out of the basement. So he keeps saying it's just a joke. But he, he uses, like, several different inflections, which makes me think that they just used every ADR take. Yeah. It's like, it's just a joke. It's just a joke. It's just a joke. Like, like, it's like it's, he yeah. just kept going on and on about it by Very himself. Weird. It's just a joke. It's just a joke. Just a joke. <laughs> That'll happen with some other lines, too, in the film. We cut right to a meeting of the cast and crew led by producer Steve Faith and director Franklin Flem. Everyone is handed scripts. The producer reminds everyone not to annoy Bert because his boat has the only phone. Mr. Faith tells them that this will be an optimistic story because everything these days is super depressing, but Taylor keeps jumping in to suggest that a happy story is unrealistic. The film is about a band who raise money to help a school's music program, which seems like an impossible story to record with seven actors on an uninhabited island. <laughs> but who knows? It's like, who's going to play the audience? <laughs> there better be a much bigger boat coming. We see BJ rehearsing her lines poorly, and director Flem wanders in to check on her progress. She reads her climactic scene, and the director seems as disappointed with her performance as we're supposed to be with the writing. Make love to me, Rick. I need you now. Right now. Flem starts striking lines from the script to account for her shortcomings, and when she steps away to the bathroom, producer Faith enters to ask how it's going. For some reason, the director had no hand in her casting and pretends to approve of the girl. 
Maybe because if this movie doesn't happen, he couldn't get another directing gig. John and Donna start harassing Bert about what's for dinner, which is exactly what they were warned not to do for fear of him quitting and cutting their only line of contact with the mainland. Bert tells them how furious he is to have been roped into this job and to never ask him questions again or they don't get food at all. I'm not going to mess with a bunch of food-picky drug freaks. Donna and John poke more fun at Bert in the next room until Taylor, the depressed guitarist, interrupts to announce that the world is going to be nuked to hell soon anyway and there's no reason to care about lunch when they'll all be dead soon. After he walks away, Donna has to admit he's right about the world being terrible and asks where John is going. To shoot myself. I want to be first at the pearly gates. I hate long lines. <laughs> Left alone in the room, Bert sneaks up on Donna with a knife to announce the dinner plan. We're having fish. I like fish. We cut outside to Phil, ready to jump into a small pool, but we get several inserts of the pool bubbling with a tense score. Unclear at the moment if this water is literally boiling or somehow acidic, but there isn't any steam rising from it in the wide shots, so I would have assumed the latter. He tests it with his hand first and announces it is indeed boiling. <laughs> As he walks around the edge, another of the same cassette player from the first killing swings into frame with a song blaring lyrics about boiling someone. And Phil is shoved backward into the boiling pool. His skin is quickly peeling all over and he can't reach the sides before succumbing to the deadly burns. The tape player is tossed into the pool with him. After which it would definitely not work ever again yeah. and well, the tape would be destroyed. Okay, so just, I mean, I know it's a little bit of a spoiler, but the tape player appears every There's time, like every time somebody's murdered. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> somebody had to come to this island with an entire suitcase full of the identical just the tape, same tape players. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Do you guys recall the last time we saw someone killed by way of a boiling pool? Ooh, Halloween 2. That's right. Nice. We cut from the tape at the bottom of the pool to Bert finishing dinner. Everyone looks very somber at the table, implying they've already learned by now what happened. Bert tells them it was just a dumb accident, but I'd have more questions, like, how did someone cause that? Yeah. How did you set this pool to boiling? Yeah, he, he said that there's a broken thermostat. It's like, okay, but you left the gas on to the heater? Yeah, it was like, running 24-7 the whole time this island like, has been abandoned? Well, I'm a little confused about the... Uh, utilities on this island. Right. Because that would in, be so expensive. In some cases, things seem to work, and in other cases, things don't work. Like the lights are like there's never no, on. There's no lights in the entire school, yeah. but the kitchen in the house works, and the pool is heated. Yeah. Right. Because I'm assuming it's, it's a gas heater yeah. and not an electric heater, but even if it was an electric heater and you just, uh, why would, you would just have it off. Yeah. Like- Right? If the thermostat was broken, you would definitely turn it off. <laughs> yeah. You wouldn't waste thousands of dollars of gas every day. Lynn seems to have found Phil herself and can't stop thinking about it, so people keep asking her to shut up about it already. What a horrible way to die. Do you have to keep talking about that while we're eating? It's like, get over it. It's been an hour. When Bert brings out their dinner, it's boiled lobster, and Lynn just sees her friend again. Boiled Phil. This is actually a pretty fancy dinner for what I expected right? from Bert. Hey, they're fancy actors. But he only brought like two lobsters. <laughs> they were just going to split those, I guess. Oh, there was a whole stack of lobsters. Was there? Okay. Yeah. Flem leans in to share some great news with the producer. Look, Steve, about the dead guy. Mm -hmm. Don't worry. I've written him out. We'll save a bundle. Are you going to save a bundle? Because I'm pretty sure that there's going to be a lawsuit and insurance yeah. claims. and. Let's write the rest of these people out and go home. Yeah. We cut to Taylor laying on a mattress and playing guitar with one of those half-transparent masks that just sort of morphs your face shape. Sometime later, we hear the tape playing again, and this time the lyrics just say, hurt me, hurt me, over and over. Bert and BJ try to locate the player by following the music. Eventually, Bert finds it hanging on a string in the middle of a room, and we hear more of the lyrics. Spear me, boil me, chop me, nail me, etc. Rick asks what everyone's standing around for, and Donna asks him to follow her back to bed for a relaxing back rub. Lynn sees them leave together and seems upset about it. Bert tosses the cassette player into a rocking chair and shouts to the empty house that he will find who pulled this dumb prank and avenge it. BJ sneaks around the wet bar looking for a drink, and producer Faith surprises her with his own drink. He admits to her that when he heard about Phil, his first thoughts were of the film. He didn't care about the dead kid. The rocking chair is suddenly empty, and the tape player swings into a shot again, specifically cued to the spearing lyrics. 
and we see Taylor asleep in the same mask and suddenly speared through it, through his face, and blood trickles out of his eye socket. This is a clever way to save a lot of money stabbing a person in the face. Yeah. <laughs> The next morning, Jim stares out the window at Phil's body lying on the beach under a towel. Apparently, they left it out there overnight because mm. there was no better place to store it while they waited to take it back to the mainland. Be covered in crabs. Yeah, I was going to yeah. say, the crabs are going to take it all. <laughs> Do you guys remember the last time we saw a dead body left on the beach overnight? He had a crab in his mouth. Humanoids? No. no. Um, they found him the next morning and they opened his mouth and a crab climbed out. Oh, that feels like something from... Um, the island? I don't Close. Know. It was an island. It was an island. As, as beaches are wont to be. <laughs> <laughs> um, other island movies. There's a, a live actor with a live crab in his mouth. We talked about how he should have gotten paid more. Mm. Children found the crab in his mouth. The two children who we follow for the rest of the film. Oh, oh, I got it. It's the the Blue Lagoon. That's right. Oh. Yeah. I was going to say the mixed up files. No. What is <laughs> it? Patty? Was it e. Frank Patty? Yeah. Yeah. Patty Button. Is that it? John jokes tastelessly about Jim's best friend until Jim grabs him by the collar and John dares him to bruise the lead actor like he didn't already try to quit this movie. But is he really the lead actor? John is the lead actor of this? I, well, he says. I feel like that, Rick is the lead actor. Yeah. He'll say later that he is one of the leads. Yeah. Why would he be more on board with this project now that his friend is dead, though? Like, they can't even play music the same if one mm -hmm. of the musicians is dead. John accuses Jim of unlocking the pool gate and killing Phil before he leaves the room. Bert doesn't want a dead body on his boat, and instead of just radioing to report the death, he intends to report it in person, empty-handed, and let the police come back to pick the corpse up on their own. No, see, this is what you do, is you, you take the boat back, you charge them for the boat trip back, call the police, the police charter your boat, to go and pick oh, there you go. <laughs> you and the whole dip. time you complain about having to do it, <laughs> even though you pocket all their money. I felt like the only reason to leave the body here on the beach was because it was going to turn out that Phil was the killer somehow. Like, why else would you leave his body there? It doesn't make any sense. Steve Faith tells him that he thinks the cops won't like it, and Bert reminds him that it was just a dumb accident. You ever kill anything? Yes. I was driving and I, I killed a baby. A, a baby deer. <laughs> that was a, that was a very weird place to end this. Yes. <laughs> we cut to another rehearsal between the director and BJ. He starts off trying to minimize her part, but she already knows that he's disappointed and came prepared. This time she's dressed in a robe over a swimsuit so she can reveal more skin and get his attention with a second attempt at a reading. When he finally looks up and spots the suit, he is interested, but she doesn't even get the chance to win him over because he immediately turns to jerk off. <laughs> can you hold it a second? I've got to go to the bathroom. I'll be a few minutes. I won't wash my hands. When he leaves, we see Jim peeking into the room at BJ. Outside, Rick tries to apologize for going to bed with Donna last night, but Lynn doesn't want to hear it. She shows him the tape player she found in the pool. The camera tilts up to Bert's boat leaving the island, and we hear him repeat for the third or fourth time. You know, it was a damn stupid accident. Never should have happened. Well, it was a damn stupid accident. Never should have happened. Damn stupid accident. Never should have happened. Another cassette player is swinging on the beach when Bert's boat with him and the producer Faith on board explodes in a fireball on the horizon. God almighty, what was that? That was the producer. It reminds me of uh, that running scared explosion boat where it was just like really, really badly comped over oh, the yeah. vehicle on the horizon. <laughs> Donna packs her bags that night intending to leave before she becomes the next victim. John thinks the film will definitely still happen, even with the producer and a cast member dead, and they don't even know about the other dead people. John blames the dead people for their own deaths, and Donna shoves him out of her room. She climbs into her shower, and then we get the POV of someone watching her shower in the dark through a peephole. Then, they proceed to pump a huge tank of battery acid through the shower head, and Donna is immediately melting away in the spray. It's not a super different effect from the melty skin we saw for Phil's death. Downstairs in the den, Jim is playing a techno funeral march. Rick wanders in from outside and says he couldn't find Taylor. John announces Donna's plans to leave the island and quit the film. The survivors decide to stay together, gathered here in the den, and somehow, in the course of two deaths, Jim has already pieced together a pattern that the song from the tape 
which they found playing on several cassette players now, mentions killing people by boiling them and burning them. What are you saying? It's obvious what he's saying. Someone is killing according to the lyrics. It's really only obvious to the killer, because yeah. that seems insane that you would have picked up on that from two deaths. Especially since the second time the tape deck was just swinging from a tree on the beach with no one near enough to hear right. it. They start picking random people to blame from their group, and Flem goes the safe route by picking on someone who isn't even in the room, Taylor, whose body they have yet to discover downstairs at the school. Flem suggests everybody lock up tight in their rooms to avoid any more killings tonight. Rick and Jim race each other to the school building in search of a weapon to defend themselves with. Jim finds what looks like a big aluminum level and then swats Rick in the gut with it to slow him down, but then leaves the weapon behind. What are you doing? That was a great weapon. That'll and level can... the playing field. Ah, <laughs> that's good. When Rick catches up with him again, he suddenly has a knife and Rick backs off. You are crazy. Jim explores the dark school with his knife and we see Rick keeping an eye on him from nearby. He locks Jim in a classroom and digs a nail gun out of a junk pile, intending to barricade Jim in the school, but Jim busts out of the class and they chase each other away again. We cut to John exploring the dark building with a candle in one hand, calling for Mr. Flem, and then we cut to Flem, also holding a candle, in a bedroom with BJ, and it's like, you could just have dimly lit rooms, every yeah. character doesn't need to be holding a candle. <laughs> So does that mean, so the lights don't work in the house? I think so. But the stove did? Right. I guess it's just gas that's running and no electricity. And, you know, but they're going to have, they have a band that clearly has equipment. Right. That is going and to require power. And they need cameras and other things to film. Uh, there should be some electricity. Somewhere. And then she's taking a shower at the house. So yeah. Yeah. So there's got to be hot water. Yeah. Or at least battery acid. <laughs> Hot battery acid. <laughs> you think he heated it up? Hot and cold running battery acid. <laughs> in every room. Injury. <laughs> That's pretty nice. Flem offers to rehearse the love scene, and BJ calls him a pervert. She suggests that he drop the pretense of a rehearsal, and suddenly, outside the room, John can hear the director moaning loudly as he makes love to BJ. Outside, we see another cassette player in a tree uh, reciting... <laughs> Suddenly, Flem is stabbed through the chest from under the bed, and BJ runs away screaming. Do you guys recall the last time we saw someone stabbed from underneath a bed? Friday the 13th, part two? No. Oh, it was a part one? Part one. Ah, Do you remember okay. who it was? It was Kevin Bacon. That's right. BJ runs to Lynn to announce Flem's murder, and Lynn tells John to go find and stop that shitty song again. John finds the tape player, and then Rick runs up with the nail gun. John assumes that he's the killer and threatens him with the candle just as it burns out. It's like, what were you going to do with this candle again? Just like hold it under him for a while? Or just like throw some recently hot wax at oh, him. Oh, there you go. That's his fetish anyway. Nice try, John. Lynn offers to check on Donna while Rick looks after BJ. He gives her the nail gun to defend herself, but has to mansplain a nail gun to her. He fires nails like a gun. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. There, there's way too much uh, cat and mouse in this yeah. movie. Yeah. They're just like constantly every, trading places. Yeah, everyone's like following everyone. Yeah. It's actually really hard to tell these people apart in these dark scenes when they are kind of indistinguishable. Yeah. Rick tells her to shoot either of the musician guys if she runs into them because somehow he's determined that they're at fault for all of this. John is still running around wielding an unlit candle and he <laughs> sees Jim enter the house with his new knife. Lynn finds Donna dead in the shower finally, and inexplicably, another tape deck falls down from the ceiling on a string to play the relevant section of the song. Burn me, burn me. Does the killer have like eight identical tape players, or are they just carelessly leaving it behind every time? Well, and it must be, uh, each each tape must be just that lyric over yeah. and over yeah. again. It can't be like the whole song. It's a loop. Yeah. yeah. And was this balanced on the door when she pushed it in or did is the killer just like squatting up on the top I of mean, the shower rack? I think that there's a lot of like planning that had to go into each of these murders. I mean, the amount of rigging they'd have to do yeah. to put that battery acid through the shower head and like mm -hmm. switch a valve yeah. and be behind a wall and do it at the right moment. It's like Bill and Ted setting up a recycle bin to fall on a cop in the middle of a jail. <laughs> it's like, how did you do that? How tall is this room to even support this prank? Lynn is barely phased by Donna's corpse, and when she tries to leave, she finds Jim in the doorway. He tells her that he suspects BJ and Rick are the killers and caresses her face. He asks where they are and puts his knife to her neck. Just tell me you're up here. Okay. 
When she calls his bluff, he backs away into the night. I don't know if she's calling his bluff or just giving up. <laughs> I guess, maybe. <laughs> I feel like I would have just been like, right over there. Go kill him. I don't care. <laughs> Bye. Rick and BJ are barricading themselves into a classroom at the school, but they let Lynn into the room. She tells them what happened in the last three scenes, even though we just saw it all. Where's the nail gun? I dropped it in Donna's room. She's dead. Rick tells Lynn not to tell BJ about Donna's death, but she just said it out loud. In the same room. (laughs) Right to BJ. (laughs) Like facing BJ away from Rick. Somehow BJ didn't hear her say it, but received the update psychically. Donna's dead, isn't she? How did you? Well, you just told her five seconds ago, (laughs) but also... I don't know. It's like I was there. Were you? Which feels like half-assed red herring bait, but we just saw her fucking phlegm when he got stabbed, and she clearly didn't do that, so she's not the killer. Lynn tells them to go get the nail gun together, and she'll wait here alone for some reason instead of tagging along. Rick is annoyed at BJ for wasting time, and he tells her to go back and wait with Lynn while he gets the gun alone. Like, they're 20 steps outside the classroom. He's like, you know what? Never mind. Yeah. (laughs) Go back with her. Because she's just screaming every time she runs into a flapping piece of paper in the wind. (laughs) In rapid succession, John stumbles across the corpses of Donna and Taylor. Rick leans a ladder against the outside of the house to climb directly into Donna's room and retrieve the nail gun. But Jim steps on his hand in the window frame and then stabs him in the hand. In the bushes later, Rick tries to wrap up his bleeding hand when more lyrics start playing. A chainsaw starts up in front of him, and his entire wounded hand is sliced cleanly from his arm. Then, the other hand. Then, it tears through his crotch, splattering his face and nearby flowers with blood. John drags an outboard motor, the nail gun, and a pile of wood to the beach, somehow planning to MacGyver an escape. Now, when did John get the nail gun? Uh, He must have gotten it when he found Donna's body. Okay. He starts nailing something together when the lyrics, Chop me, chop me, chop me, can faintly be heard on the wind. Insanely, he wanders over to investigate, instead of staying way out in the open with a fully loaded nail gun. (laughs) Of course, he is quickly cornered and killed before he can manage an escape. Lynn continues waiting in the classroom where Rick sent BJ, but she hasn't shown up yet. The door to the classroom, that they presumably locked tight to keep them safe, blows open in the breeze. And even though we (laughs) never see anyone come through it, Lynn is attacked from behind by someone somehow inside the classroom with her. Well, I mean, the way they're securing these doors, though, is... They just, like, lean a stick against it. Yeah, it's a piece of wood that they're just kind of propping under the handle and against the floor. And I'm like, this is a school. This is, a like, a a smooth floor. What is stopping this door from opening? Nothing. Also... You know, there are so many other ways into this. Right, yeah. Outside, BJ encounters Jim and then runs for her life. He gives chase with a tape player hanging from one hand. Jim barricades BJ into the classroom, either to imprison her as a suspect or to protect her from being the next victim. It doesn't seem like the actions the killer would be taking, though. (laughs) It seems to rule Jim out that he's not killing these people immediately when he finds them. Mm Mm-hmm. BJ tries to relax by resting with her back to a window of the classroom and a hand with a knife busts through the glass toward her. Once he has her locked inside, Jim starts to pursue her in the building, and she hides around a corner where she finds John's dismembered head impaled on a pole. Jim chases her away and seems weirdly comfortable to discover John's head here, as if he is the killer. Hi, John. Hello, John. (laughs) When he has BJ cornered, he accuses her of killing everyone for an insurance payout. BJ runs away again and scurries right past Lynn, nailed to the wall with a full clip from the nail gun. She doesn't even seem to notice her. I don't understand this insurance concept because Mm -hmm. is BJ funding this? No, but she's the widow and she just came into a bunch of money and he knows that about her. But how does that mean she would benefit from the... Because she's hired... He just knows that she had an old husband who died mysteriously and she got a huge insurance payout I just don't feel like anything would pay out to her in this Yeah, that part doesn't make sense because she's not like the EP. She's she's on the verge of getting fired from the movie. Yeah. Yeah. In a bathroom, BJ fills a tin can with hot water from a sink faucet. (laughs) A few minutes later, (laughs) while he prowls the bathroom (laughs) searching for her, she dumps the can of, at worst, room temperature water (laughs) on him and then runs away. But how is there hot water in this school? I don't know. Boiling water in the pool. Yeah, it's scalding, though. It's It's like literally... It's steaming out of the faucet. It's also coming out of the wrong faucet because it's coming out of the right-hand side. (laughs) So It reminded me of uh, The Simpsons where 
Mr. Burns Homer thinks Homer is an intruder, but leads him into the kitchen where he's going to put a pot of boiling water. It's like, <laughs> it takes too long. He's like waiting for it to boil. And Mr. Burns grabs it and throws it <laughs> over. Homer goes, eh, it's still cold. <laughs> <laughs> Do you guys recall the last time we saw a character dump harmless water on someone who they should have murdered? Uh... <laughs> it was a babysitter, and she picked up a fishbowl and stood by a doorway, and we thought she was going to drop it over the kid's head. But when the kid walked through the door, she just poured the water on him and then threw the fishbowl the opposite way. <laughs> <laughs> um, I do remember this movie, but I can't think of the title. Is it? Um, it's, it's not The Children, is it? No. No. no it, was it the one? Different Killer Kids movie. No. Yeah, yeah I was going to say it was the, um, it wasn't Happy Birthday to me. It was the other one. It was Bloody Birthday? Bloody Birthday. Ah. Nice. Good job. Jim catches up with BJ one last time, and just as he puts his knife to her throat, Jim catches several nails in his back. Across the room, we see a bloodied and bruised Steve Faith, the producer, who we were supposed to believe died in the exploding boat. Jim hucks his knife into the man's chest before succumbing to the tiny nail injuries, and then Faith drops from the stabbing. BJ crawls across the room to comfort the man who saved her, but he shudders and passes out. We jump forward in time to police coming the crime scene, Inexplicably, the mayor is here, personally investigating with them. <laughs> he is briefed on the situation. A detective plays a tape they found out loud, and it's a man's voice, possibly Jim's. Testing. I boiled him. I burned him. I chopped him in two. I nailed him. I speared him. I stabbed him in two. Nobody knows. No one will care. Because when I'm done, nobody there. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> I can't help but be reminded of the Dear Sister SNL sketch, so I fully <laughs> expected the voice to start describing the police coming the scene, nonsensically shooting each other to death. <laughs> what you say? <laughs> P.S. Then two cops will read this letter and shoot each other. Now, isn't that the most ridiculous thing you've <laughs> The cops mention here that the producer is still alive but nearly bled to death. He was just medevaced from the island. Left alone in the room, the mayor relays his condolences to the ghost of Bert, whose hopes of a church retreat protecting his beloved island from development are all but dashed. No church is going to want this place. No church is going to want this place. He could barely contain his excitement, but what's he going to do again? Build condos on a tiny island yeah. that people have to ferry back and forth to? Makes it seem like he coordinated the killings, but we'll learn right away that he had nothing to do with it. <laughs> we cut to the backyard of producer Steve Faith's mansion. He dives into his pool, and BJ is sunning herself beside it. She offers to fix him a coffee, and he walks away to answer a phone call. He's got no stab wound. Right, yeah. No, he's totally fine. This is years later. <laughs> She seems to have another premonition and follows him into the house before overhearing part of his conversation. Turns out, Faith was the killer the whole time, and he recorded each murder to sell as miniature snuff films, like little minisodes for his murder Patreon. <laughs> now don't go getting ideas here. <laughs> <laughs> but here's the thing. He couldn't have. Well, how, how why couldn't would, he have? How would he film, film himself tying Lynn up Unless he killed her first and then tied her up? Never be too safe. Because she was literally, like, crucified to a cork board. Yeah. He just had a camera hooked up to himself on, like, a thing. <laughs> a and rig? He, yeah. Like a steady cam yeah. rig? Daddy cam. <laughs> That's all I got. No. Arnie, look. These are the best death films you've ever seen. There is nothing like this on the market. BJ stares in shock as the footage Faith captured is needlessly projected on a wall as proof for the man on the phone. <laughs> it's just the same clips we saw edited into this film, so we were actually seeing the POV of his camera during each of these kills. As he hangs up, he spots BJ spying on him. I thought I told you never to come down here. Faith explains that Jim's taped confession was actually just a recorded audition scene. He tells her that he'll have to kill her now, and she snatches a shotgun off the fireplace mantle. He assures her it isn't loaded, and we get almost the same close-up insert of the gun barrel from the cold open before she pulls the trigger, and then we cut to black on a loud bang. Go ahead. Go ahead, pull the trigger. Pull it! 
So was it loaded? Yes. yes. Do you Why was he so confident that it wasn't loaded that he told her to pull the Maybe trigger? Maybe he was trying to uh, psych her out. I don't know. It seems like he psyched her in. Do you remember the last time the, uh, an antagonist was held at gunpoint and urging the person to shoot them? Hmm. And then got shot? And then got shot thinking it would be ineffectual. But it Superman was... in a deleted scene? No. No, because he was saying, don't shoot me. Yeah. I don't know. Uh, I'm going with the howling. Oh, okay. It was like, take your best fucking shot. It's like, silver bullet my ass. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. I really wanted to see Rick's head just roll to the bottom of the swimming pool <laughs> after this shot. It's like, wait, did that happen again? <laughs> she shot him inside. The same terrible song from the tape plays over the credits. The end. So why did Faith fake his death on the boat? Or so was that he that wouldn't be a suspect. unrelated? No, I think... I think he- he had to kill Bert. Right. And he had to try to not be part of the ongoing like mm. shenanigans on yeah, the Yeah, because otherwise people would be like, where is he? Where did he yeah, go? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they had to fake his death so that he could be running around with a camera strapped to his chest. Yeah. But I feel like the part, the, walls. the part where it sort of falls apart is not knowing like that Jim, Jim could have killed him. So when he goes to when he goes oh when he gets stabbed at the yeah because yeah. they I mean I assume that he legitimately got shot with nails and passed out and needed yeah. to be medevaced out. Well, no the the one who got shot with the nails was Jim. It was, was Jim, Jim and he died. But Jim threw a knife at. Faith and got him in the stomach or something. Which oh. might be the only serious wound that Faith incurred. But okay. he is like kind of beaten up when he when he shows up as if he had survived the explosion on the boat. Right. But it might just be from fighting with people on the way to killing them this whole Right. Time. I assumed that the injuries that he had coming into that weren't real, but he got some going out. Right. I think so. Yeah. Because he wasn't expecting to get hit with that blade for sure. And that's why, you know, they the even the cops say he almost died. He almost Wait, so then out. Jim didn't die. Jim did die. Jim did die. Jim did die. Yeah. Faith didn't die. Right. Faith is the one who they got out in time before he bled to death. But I guess he also needed at least someone to corroborate his story of, right. I saved her. Here's Jim's confession. And BJ is the only person who knows that he was a good guy. Mm-hmm. So he needed her to, yeah, to, to have the same story and to testify, no, he's a good guy. He saved my life. And all these other people killed each other. We don't even know who's responsible. Probably Jim. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's uh, Who Done It slash uh, <laughs> Island of Blood. I, I think this is a thumbs down. Oh yeah, it's it's not even particularly fun. Yeah, and the the only kills that we see are the skin sloughing off. You know, I poured Elmer's glue on my friend kills. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, because the the stab through a mask isn't interesting. We don't even see the chop in the face. Right. No. Yeah, and I didn't know who got stabbed. Like. I, I got so confused of who was who. So when when, <laughs> when they say who done it, they mean who are these yeah, people? <laughs> who done it and, and who too? <laughs> That's not what the sequel would be called. <laughs> who too? Yeah. So so I saw a person stabbed in the mask. I was like, okay, well I don't know who that was. That was Taylor. Okay, that was Taylor. Yeah. I don't know who the, Taylor was. The guy who was like, they're gonna nuke the world, man. Oh, okay. Yeah. Was he, he was the one with, with the hand on with his, the hand. His, yeah, yeah, the face on his hand. Yeah. For some reason, he's like super Debbie Downer, but he's also like big into puppetry. <laughs> yeah, it's a thumbs down for me. Yeah, uh, I mean, just on the basis mostly of being just a bad horror film, but not even like an interesting. Just, just once, I really want one of these horror films to, to like subvert, like in my head canon of where this movie was going is like, oh, I get it. They're making, they're going to be making a B movie about a slasher but the slasher's real but then it's going to be part of the movie like it's going to like it's, it's going to be gonna, like effects it's going to like trick you yeah um and it never does that it never no. does the thing that i want it to do yeah um where would you put this though letterboxed do you think oh that that's oh the... it's my number one <laughs> yeah i i think so too <laughs> can i just not rank it <laughs> no this is this is going top of your list because it's also the bottom of all our lists because we're starting new lists today. January's, new lists, everybody. January is really rough when it comes to our lists. Yeah, it's uh, it's sad. Um, I, don't, I, I didn't even make them yet on Letterboxd, oh, okay. so I'll, I'll make them later. Yeah. 
Um, <laughs> but uh, you'll know where to yeah. put this. I know. Yeah, I know yeah, where yeah. this one goes. I, even compared to the next episode, I know where this one goes. Um, our director here was William T. Nod. He previously directed Thunder and Dixie, Hot Rod Hullabaloo, and Blackjack. After this, he directed a Rocky parody called Ricky One with a stripper slash boxer protagonist. He's better known for creating game shows like Rhyme and Reason and Haggis Baggis. <laughs> <laughs> Ever heard of that one? Because I have not. The music here came from Joel Goldsmith. Mm, he is yes. the son of Jerry Goldsmith. Yeah, you know, there was a lot of like Goldsmith-esque Stuff, inspiration. Yeah. Like so, some of the like the the like chasing beats was like, this sounds like something from First Blood. Yeah. Um, and there was a lot of uh, that instrument, the the I wrote it down, the water water phone. That's that like, thing that goes like the like screechy kind of <laughs> instrument. You ever yeah, seen yeah. it? It's like a it's like a conical shape of all these different shaped metals, and they just like violin string across it. Yeah. Uh, there was a lot of that. I thought it was a blaster beam. Yeah. And it was but like, it wasn't rackety enough. Yeah, yeah. I was, I was like, okay, so it's Joel it, Goldsmith, and you know, like he because uh, they did work on because they do Star Trek with yeah, the blaster beam. Star, yeah, exactly. And and he they has a he has a sound credit on uh, the motion picture. Right. Yeah. So I thought, oh man, I bet he got yeah, yeah. Huxley to come and do blaster but beam no. stuff. But no. <laughs> no way they could talk him onto this movie. <laughs> uh, Joel previously scored Laser Blast, and he comes back to score The Man with Two Brains, Ricky One, and later lots of Stargate stuff. Most of his credits are Stargate stuff. Uh, the cinematographer here was Thomas E. Spaulding. We saw his work last on The Blob for a uh, Patreon request. He also lit all three previous William T. Nod films. The editor here was Hari Riot. This is Hari's only editor credit. Michael Stroka played the mayor. We saw him for a 1980 minisode called PSI Factor, which was terrible. He also made 64 appearances on the Dark Shadows TV series. Bari Suber played Betty Jean, a.k.a. BJ. She was a PA on Demented, which got a minisode last season. That was her biggest credit before this. She was a PA on another movie that we didn't deem worthy of a regular episode. Stephen Tash played Phil. He's definitely the most recognizable face from this group. We see him next in Christine, and then his best-known role, male student in Ghostbusters. I'm getting a little tired of this. You volunteered, didn't you? We're paying you, aren't we? Yeah, but I didn't know you were going to be giving me electric shock. Jimmy Williams played Policeman. We've seen him in Hollywood Nights, Raging Bull, and Inside Moves, and he's also Sergeant Johnson in Samurai Cop. And that's all the credits I have for this one. If you have any thoughts you'd like to share, you can find all our socials at linktree slash vintage video pod. If you enjoy what we're doing, consider giving us a review on iTunes. I don't believe it helps our visibility, but it's good for morale. And if you really like the show, then maybe you should join our Patreon campaign at patreon.com slash vintage video pod for access to around 50 reviews of 70s films and a hand in choosing our monthly 50th anniversary review. For February of 1974, patrons are currently choosing between Blazing Saddles, Mel Brooks's beloved Western comedy starring Gene Wilder, Cleavon Little, Madeline Kahn, and Alex Karras. Busting, Peter Hyam's buddy comedy about a pair of vice cops going after a local mobster against orders. It stars Elliot Gould, Robert Blake, Alan Garfield, and Antonio Fargus. Deep Throat Part 2, Joe Sarno's sequel to the golden age porno Deep Throat about a woman born with a clitoris in her throat. It stars Linda Lovelace, Harry Reams, and Levi Richards. Deranged. Jeff Gillen and Alan Ormsby's loose biopic of the life of serial killer Ed Gein, renamed Ezra Cobb, and played by Home Alone's snow salter, Roberts Blossom. It also stars Cossett Lee and Leslie Carlson. Thieves Like Us, Robert Altman's period dramedy about a pair of 30s bank robbers who break out of prison to continue their spree. It stars Keith Carradine, Shelley Duvall, John Shuck, Burt Remsen, and Louise Fletcher. Sugar Hill, Paul Maslansky's Blaxploitation zombie film, starring Marky Bay, Robert Quarry, and Don Pedro Colley as Baron Samity. And finally, Zardoz, John Borman's sci-fi fantasy film about a 23rd century post-apocalypse and the adventures of Zed, played by Sean Connery. It also stars Charlotte Rampling, Sarah Kestelman, and John Alderton for a 50th anniversary review next month. Thank you so much for listening, and I hope you'll join us next time when we'll be discussing Splits which IMDb describes like so. An all-female rock band and a group of well-endowed sorority sisters team up to save a sorority house slated for condemnation by the university. We leave you now with the trailer for Splits. Splits. <laughs> <laughs>
Walk proudly, all ye who pass through these gates. For these are the gates of knowledge. Oh, yes. These are the rewards of higher education. The very backbone of our society. Busy in the morning, busy all day. You got so much to do and no What time. are we, a bunch of self-defeatists, wimps? Come on! Such a busy oh, day. Hello, all you fame fans. We're backstage with the Splits, just another college rock and roll band with a dream. One of your houses must be torn down. So we will have three events. Soccer, wrestling, and basketball. The first house to lose will be the one to go. Just because I'm playing fair and square doesn't mean you have to. Do you read me? We have to think of a way to get to Dean Hunter. God help me, something's happening. You, my love. There's nothing like a little sweet revenge to get the old blood flowing again, huh? All diamonds in me. <laughs> Dirty teeth are a terrible sin. So open your mouth and shove me in. That makes love so real. Ladies and gentlemen, the split! Am I asking for too much? You gotta look through the blinds, Louie, not at him. The stars in the sky. You're out. And that's unfair. It is my ambition to be unfair. Jesus. Good love's what I need. Desire's what I bring. There is a lot at stake here. 